the probabilities of suitable conditions for Thursday are about 20% right now. It's probably worth making the effort to be ready. Um, a week ago, we were getting lots of cold frontal passages. Now we don't seem to be able to get one to go through at all. We're in, under the influence of the one that's been approaching from the west. So we may expect uh, occasional rain uh, for off and on during the next 24 hours. The best guess right now is that uh, by Thursday, the gradient wind would be about 160 degrees, and I think we'd like to see it a little bit uh, more west to south. St. Louis, Missouri. In and around this city, a massive scientific project is underway, one which may eventually take five years and involve a dozen local and national agencies. The object is a comprehensive study of urban pollution, where does it come from? Where does it go and what happens to it? How does it affect weather or plants or microorganisms? There's nothing unique about pollution in St. Louis. What the scientists learned here could apply to almost any modern city. On a farm near Athensville, Illinois, some 60 miles downwind from St. Louis, a group of chemists from the National Center for Atmospheric Research has established a field site. Their objective is to determine the extent of pollution at various distances from the city, despite the natural processes by which the air cleanses itself. Their part in the study doesn't begin officially until the summer of 1973. They are here now to conduct field tests of sampling methods and equipment and to establish guidelines for the full study. The samples we were analyzing today were those we took at the three sites yesterday, the 30, 60, and 120 miles. And you remember we assigned an extremely high priority to this test because we wanted to see how our distances worked out, where we right or wrong in setting the 60 and, or excuse me, 80 and 120 kilometer rings for the basic study. For the preliminary study, Four sampling sites were established with a mobile laboratory at Athensville. In 1973, sampling will be expanded to a network of locations along two rings with radii of 80 and 120 kilometers. Fourteen small movable ground stations will be deployed, two upwind and 12 downwind, depending upon prevailing wind and weather conditions. Aircraft will also be used for sampling at various altitudes above the site. All samples will be forwarded to a central headquarters for daily analysis. Weather forecasts for the St. Louis study are actually made 900 miles away by meteorologists at the NCAR Mesa Lab in Boulder, Colorado. Most of the information we used for the forecast we had received in here by 10 o'clock in the morning and then uh, by a long distance telephone conversation with either John Pate or Harold Bainton in St. Louis uh, I would convey the for what I thought the forecast uh, should be for the following day to them and then they would make a decision as to whether they wanted to actually sample the next day or not. Most of the air sampling equipment is lightweight and self-contained. It can be transported into the field and set up quickly, so there is no need for permanent installations. For sampling trace gases, the chemistry group from NCAR has developed a simple but effective piece of field equipment. It consists of a series of gas bubblers containing various chemical reagents through which air samples are dispersed. The components are interchangeable and can be completely disassembled, enabling the entire setup to be carried in a single trunk. These same units have already seen extensive service on expeditions to study trace gases in remote areas of the globe. Instead of complicated valves and flow meters, the system uses hypodermic needles to control the airflow rate. Needles of different sizes can be inserted into the same pump hose to allow simultaneous sampling 
at various flow rates. Now the reason we do this is to protect the reagents from the sun and the heat. Otherwise, you get uh, a lot of discoloration in their blanks. Samples are taken four to six times a day. Each sampling period runs for one hour. We have a 24-hour canister to be collected, and there will be some biological samples being collected on the ground. Now, in addition, hopefully we'll have the Queen Air flights, as well as the Bonanza flights, and I'm going to call on... During the Charlie. field test phase, Frequent staff meetings are essential to discuss problems and coordinate planning between chemists, meteorologists, and pilots. I'm not sure whether anything can be arranged on aerial biological samples or not. I suspect it would be, but at least we, uh, very good. Well, we'll explore that in a moment. But that's the quick overview of the 24-hour uh, sampling period. Dave, I'll turn it over to you now to give a quick resume, and then we'll... All right, in the sample inventory that John just went over, there were some of the newer samples that were mentioned that no one is familiar with. I think it might be a good idea that if you heard something you're not familiar with, to ask about it tomorrow, and then we can find out about at least familiarizing you with it. In addition to gas sampling, the group collects a variety of particulate samples. The simplest device for particle collecting is the IPC filter, a special paper developed originally by the Institute of Paper Chemistry for airborne radioactivity sampling. Another sampling device used in the field test is a condensation nuclei counter used to detect tiny airborne particles around which water droplets form. The question is whether pollutants can cause increased local rainfall. Any long range increase would seriously affect the ecology of a wide area. Looks like we're going to have a wide dynamic range of analysis. Of course, this gives us a better handle on any kind of measurement this far up in the city. We were kind of surprised about the clean background that we got on Wednesday. I expected it to be higher, didn't you, Art? I certainly did. The background was extremely clean. That was really something. Northwest wind, of course, there aren't many pollutant sources in that direction. Uh, well, there could be. The biggest pollutant source that uh, no in that direction is three times any of that any of that in St. Louis, as I understand it. Yeah, but it couldn't compare with the. That's the Thomas Hill plant. It couldn't compare with all the output of the car automobiles in St. Louis. Oh no. Is this water that's condensed up in the neck, is that going to affect your volume or anything? No. But uh, if it turns out with the other constituents, the ones we're measuring this trip, of course, uh, right now, today, is NO2, SO2, ammonia. If it turns out that we have a wide dynamic range of analysis on the others also, then we should be really in good shape as far as a handle to discuss mechanism is concerned. Not all samples can be analyzed in the field. Special impactors collect submicron dust particles on optical or electron microscope grids for later analysis back at NCAR. Five minutes? Five minutes. We've got a 40, 14.45, so we're two minutes late.
Spot reactions of some particles on the surface of membrane filters are used to identify types of particles. The filter is treated with a reagent which produces a spot proportionate to the size of the particle. The Wartburg single stage impactor contains 12 electron microscope grids. Under the electron microscope, some particles are chemically identified by shape and density. The collection grid has been prepared for viewing by coating it with chromium, a process called shadowing, which gives the particle a three-dimensional appearance. Interpretation is difficult at best. Electron microscopy requires the skill and patience of a chess master. Briefly, the sampling will start at 6.30, and that will be a gas and a particulate sequence together. And if everything is right, if there's an aversion layer that can be defined to some extent, we'd like to have three traverses. Three. Two, with one within the inversion layer, or beneath of an <coughs> inversion layer, and one at the inversion layer, and one above. If we fly two traverses in the morning and two in the evening, we will need three and a half, three hours. Mm -hmm. If we fly three in the morning and three in the, later on in the day, we'll need four and a half hours. Mm -hmm. So we can just about scrape under the line. Fine. I mean, the Queen Air preferably will fly at first light to coincide with our particulate sequence, as well as Ted's plane. And the next flight for the particulate sequence will be at 1100. Aboard the in-car aircraft Queen Air, similar impactors and filtering equipment collect airborne samples above the collection sites for correlation with ground results. We yes. should get plenty of samples to take care of that uh, low efficiency problem. At well, least we can find out if we get any correlation between the IPC on the ground and the IPC in the air. Mm -hmm. And you, you would want this flying in one of the flights, you'd need three IPCs. Right. Or <coughs> just two. Well, we can go with two. Well, three. One, one within the mixing depth and, and one, one over. Oh. Yeah. And that well, cuts down the requirement. If we, can get the, if we can get the washed IPCs mounted in Boulder and then sent out of here again, then I don't really see any reason why we can't do that. Right. Well, there was a very good reason for calling it out in the first place, too. And that was, we want to see if they will work. Yeah. They don't have to be that efficient. See? Okay, now, what do we got next here? Oops, the chloride. Lending further air support to the field test is a single-engine Bonanza, heavily equipped for atmospheric sampling and piloted by Professor Ted Stamfer from the University of Missouri at Raleigh. Well, it looks very much on the results we have so far, and again, these are preliminary. Uh, they have yet to be calculated. We were right. The nitrogen dioxide, the background is higher than we expected in the clean air, but yesterday when we had the St. Louis plume over the area, that, as we had predicted, it turned out we couldn't see any of it. It disappeared and reacted before it moved out in this area. In the mobile laboratory, gas samples are quantitatively analyzed on a spectrophotometer. Well, this, uh, this first sample sure shows uh, the effects of the inversion layer, doesn't it? Oh, it's dirty. Were they that dirty the other day? Mm, not with a northwest wind, no. Yeah, I didn't think so. As far as the ammonia goes, as we expected, we had a fairly high ammonia background in the clean air. In other words, the background air in this area. Interestingly enough, and as we had predicted, and I think this is going to be our crowning achievement, when we had the air from St. Louis, down went the ammonia. The reaction with SO2 was occurring, as near as we can tell, so that it is below the clean air background, as we had predicted. So, uh, as I say, we're glowing a wee bit tonight by this, because of these preliminary results.
The SO2, on the other hand, the data are confused. Uh, we have this problem that at the north site, the sulfur dioxide concentrations we saw yesterday are somewhat higher than those we see <coughs> intermediate. So now I'll make this assignment. When the St. Louis Roger study is over, we should know more about the mechanisms of urban pollution, its effect on local environment, and its impact on the total global atmosphere. That knowledge alone won't save our cities or make them more livable, but it will provide a basis for rational urban planning in the years ahead.